In 2017, two members of a Russian crime syndicate were charged with the transport and sale of 10,000 pounds of stolen chocolate confections. The indictment didn't mention whether the thieves took a few bites for themselves, but if they did have a sweet tooth, they'd hardly be alone. Napoleon Bonaparte was a fan of chocolate, which was said to be his drink of choice when working late. Thomas Jefferson fell in love with it while serving as minister to France and proclaimed that it might soon be more popular than tea or coffee. And though she probably never said, let them eat cake, Marie Antoinette was known to enjoy hot chocolate, which was served at the Palace of Versailles. Mmm. History. Hi, I'm Justin Dodd. Welcome to Food History. And thanks to Laura McKinlay for suggesting this topic back on our first episode of the series. Chocolate's worldwide popularity streak has lasted centuries, but it wasn't always the sweet, easily accessible treat we know today. So, what is chocolate, and how did it transform from sacred beverage to sweet snack? Every chocolate product starts with the cacao tree. The plants were originally native to the Americas, but today they're grown worldwide, primarily in tropical regions. The fruits of cacao trees are called pods. One pod is roughly the size of a football, and it contains around 40 almond-sized cacao beans, which are actually seeds. When fermented and roasted, cacao beans develop a rich, complex flavor. They're the key to making chocolate taste uh, chocolatey. The word cacao, by the way, usually refers to the plant and its seeds before they're processed, while chocolate describes products made from processed cacao beans. And if you're wondering what the difference between cacao and cocoa is, there really isn't one. Both versions of the plant name are technically correct, but in modern usage, cacao is increasingly applied to things closer to the plant, while cocoa is used for the more processed stages. Cacao is definitely more fun to say, though. Cacao. There is some debate over who first decided to turn raw cacao beans into processed chocolate. One long-standing theory posits that humans were first drawn to the pulp of the cacao pod, which they used to make an alcoholic beverage. The oldest evidence we have for consumption of cacao products comes from 5,000 years ago in what is now Ecuador. At some point, chocolate migrated north. Evidence of cacao residue has been found in vessels from the Olmec people in what is now southern Mexico. It's still unclear if this cacao was the result of beer-like fermented beverages made from cacao pods or some kind of chocolate that would be more recognizable to us today. According to art and hieroglyphs from Central America and Southern Mexico, chocolate was a big part of Maya culture. That chocolate didn't look or taste anything like a Hershey's bar, though. Back then, chocolate was sipped rather than eaten. And to make these chocolate drinks, the Maya harvested beans from cacao pods and fermented them. As I described in our episode on ketchup and mustard, fermentation is basically controlled rot. Microorganisms like yeast and bacteria break down the organic substances in food, changing the taste on a biochemical level without making the food go bad. Fermentation also generates heat. When a pile of cacao beans ferments, it can exceed 120 degrees Fahrenheit. This heat is essential in developing chocolate's signature flavor and aroma. It unlocks flavor compounds we associate with chocolate and activates enzymes that mellow the cacao bean's natural bitterness. It's also what kills the germ, or embryo, in the middle of a bean that would cause it to sprout and dissolves any leftover pulp from the cacao pod surrounding the beans. Whoo, man, that was a lot of science all at once. I think we all deserve a little reward. No. After they're fermented for several days, cacao beans are dried, roasted, shelled, and ground into a paste called chocolate liquor. Roasting is an important step. It creates new flavor compounds and concentrates other flavors that were already there. It also burns off acetic acid, a natural byproduct of fermentation which can give chocolate an undesirable vinegary flavor. And while I do love salt and vinegar chips, I don't think I would like it in my chocolate. These early steps in the chocolate making process haven't changed much over the centuries. The main difference in the Maya preparation came after the beans were processed. Instead of using the ground cacao beans to make candy or desserts, they mixed the paste with water, cornmeal, and spices like chili peppers to make a thick, savory beverage. By pouring the liquid from one container to another a few times, they were able to give it a frothy head, which was a big part of the drink's appeal, apparently. Chocolate was especially popular among the elite. It was enjoyed by Maya rulers, and cacao beans and chocolate paraphernalia have been found in royal tombs. Priests drank chocolate and used it in religious ceremonies. Cacao was considered a gift from the gods, and it was featured in Maya weddings, where the bride and groom would exchange sips of the beverage to seal their union. In addition, after important transactions were agreed to, the two parties would share a drink of chocolate to make it official. Cute. The Aztecs, who dominated central Mexico from around 1300 to 1521, were just as enamored with chocolate. They used cacao beans as currency. One bean was worth a tamale, while a hundred beans was enough to get you a quality female turkey. And chocolate played a role in Aztec religious ceremonies too. 
In their book, The True History of Chocolate, Sophie and Michael Coe mention a Spanish chronicler who wrote that sacrifice victims, who weren't in the mood to participate in the ritual dances leading up to their deaths, were given chocolate to boost their spirits. I guess there are worse things you could be subjected to right before your own ritual sacrifice, but the fact that the chocolate was mixed with blood from previous human sacrifice victims probably didn't do wonders for morale. This is probably as good a place as any to mention that I have an aunt whose entire bathroom is decked out in chocolate decor. Like, chocolate towels, chocolate wall art with little sassy chocolate phrases written on them. I've never seen her eat or talk about chocolate, but we've all just accepted that this is what her bathroom looks like. Anyway, according to Aztec legend, the Emperor Montezuma II could have given my aunt Carol a run for her money. I mean, they didn't mention Carol, but you know what I mean. Montezuma II, who incidentally is increasingly referred to as Moctezuma in English because it more closely resembles the original Aztec, was rumored to have drunk a gallon of chocolate a day. But he didn't just like it for the taste. Chocolate was believed to be an aphrodisiac, and he purportedly binged the drink to fuel his affairs. Chocolate never lost its romantic reputation, but the scientific evidence for its amorous abilities is actually pretty limited. Chocolate contains the compounds tryptophan and phenylethylamine, and tryptophan does help the body make serotonin, which is associated with feelings of happiness and well-being. Phenylethylamine releases dopamine, otherwise known as the feel-good neurotransmitter. I wouldn't know personally, but I've heard that it's nice to have higher levels of dopamine. Tryptophan and phenylethylamine may qualify as aphrodisiacs, but there probably aren't enough of them in cacao beans to produce any noticeable effects. The word chocolate originated in Mesoamerica. Like the Aztecs and Maya, the Papil people of what is today El Salvador brewed drinks from cacao beans, and they called these beverages chocolatl. It's thought that when the first Spaniards to visit the region heard the word, they basically kept it. The name still persists today and largely unchanged from its original language. A number of European explorers, from Christopher Columbus to Hernan Cortez, have been credited with bringing chocolate back home after traveling to the Americas. But the first chocolate to land in Europe may not have come from a famous explorer at all. Some historians say Spanish mercenaries were instrumental in getting cacao across the Atlantic. Upon returning from an overseas trip, Catholic friars presented a group of Maya dignitaries to the court of Prince Philip in 1544. The Maya brought with them gifts from the New World, including, you guessed it, the Sports Illustrated football phone. Just kidding, chocolate. This offering marks the first recorded evidence of chocolate in Spain. Soon enough, chocolate spread to the rest of Europe, where it underwent its next big transformation. The drink was too bitter for European palates, so people started adding more sweeteners to the mix. Different countries added their own spices. The Spanish liked cinnamon and vanilla in their chocolate, while the French flavored their chocolate with cloves. In Europe, as in Mesoamerica, chocolate was mostly enjoyed by the upper classes. In 17th century Britain, a pound of chocolate cost 15 shillings, which was about 10 days worth of wages for a skilled tradesman. In 1657, London opened its first chocolate house, a place where men could gather to gamble, do business, and discuss politics over a nice cup of cocoa. Chocolate was already a global success story by the 19th century, but it might never have become the nearly ubiquitous treat we know today if it wasn't for a Dutch chemist named Conrad Johannes van Houten. In 1828, he discovered that by removing some of the fat, or cocoa butter, from chocolate liquor and treating it with alkaline salt, he could turn the ingredient into a new kind of powder. Alkaline substances, as I explained in our ramen episode, are basically the opposite of acidic substances. Adding the alkaline salts to chocolate created a product that had a more mellow, earthier taste. If you see natural cocoa powder and Dutch processed cocoa powder next to each other at the grocery store, know that the natural stuff will generally be more acidic than Van Houten's Dutch version. Dutch cocoa powder was easier to mix with water than ground up beans, but the invention had implications far beyond that. His work eventually helped give us the first modern chocolate bars. A British candy maker named J.S. Fry and Sons created solid chocolate in 1847 after mixing melted cocoa butter back into cocoa powder and letting it harden. If you're not familiar with this company, J.S. Fry and Sons, you've likely heard of Cadbury, which pioneered the heart-shaped chocolate box in the 1860s. In the 1900s, the two companies worked together to import South American cacao beans to England, but the Cadburys eventually made a series of deals with farmers to cut their partner rivals out of the supply chain. This led to some good old-fashioned chocolate beef, which I believe now takes the top spot for most disgusting combination of words uttered on this show. The beef doesn't stop there. In his book, Chocolate, A Bittersweet Saga of Dark and Light, Mort Rosenblum tells the story of Cecil Fry's funeral at Westminster Abbey. When Fry's widow saw the patriarch of the Cadbury family file into the ceremony late, she apparently rose to her feet and shouted, Get out, devil! Swiss chemist Henry Nestle created a powdered milk product in the mid-19th century, which a countryman by the name of Daniel Peter decided to add to chocolate. 
This was the debut of a new product called Milk Chocolate. Today, the FDA defines milk chocolate as having at least 10% chocolate liquor and 12% milk solids. These standards are far from universal. In Europe, milk chocolate must contain at least 25% dry cocoa solids and 14% dry milk solids. When it comes to white chocolate, on the other hand, the only product derived from cacao beans is cocoa butter. There's some debate over whether it should be considered chocolate at all. I personally could leave white chocolate at the door, but that's just me. If there's any strong white chocolate fans out there, please leave a comment trying to convince me otherwise. The company many Americans associate with chocolate today didn't arrive on the scene until fairly recently. Milton Hershey got his start in the candy business selling caramels, or caramels, not chocolate bars. The entrepreneur fell in love with chocolate at the 1893 World's Fair. He was so impressed by Germany's chocolate production display that he bought their machinery when the exposition was over and started making chocolate professionally the next year. By the way, speaking of chocolate beef, an early slogan for Hershey's was, our milk chocolates are highly nutritious, easily digested, and far more sustaining than meat. Uh, uh okay, sure. In 1900, Milton sold his caramel business for $1 million and fully devoted himself to the Hershey Chocolate Company. The company got so big that Milton Hershey built an entire town for his employees to live in. Now, people can visit Hershey, Pennsylvania to ride candy-themed rides at Hershey Park, see how chocolate is made at Hershey's Chocolate World, or take a bath in real chocolate at the Hotel Hershey. Some of our international viewers would probably turn their noses up at a Hershey's bar, although I have to say, try one in a s'more and then thank the good old US of A and the Girl Scouts of America, who published what is debatably the first known recipe for some mores in the 1927 guidebook, Tramping and Trailing with the Girl Scouts. I can't say whether the sweet snobbery is well-founded or not, but I can say that the situation was almost worse. Back in 2007, a group of lobbyists sought to change the FDA's definition of chocolate to allow for the removal of cocoa butter entirely, in exchange for more affordable, accessible alternatives like vegetable oils. It seems this effort failed, so you can rest assured, the next time a pair of former Soviet bloc gangsters steal a few tons of chocolate here in the United States, cocoa butter will be part of the haul. Drop your favorite chocolate bar in the comments, but be nice, there are no wrong answers here. Except Almond Joy, that is wrong. It's just wrong, you get out.